Let's, I will just go through this very quickly so we can have the workshop after. Oh. Yep. Joel, do you mind going back a, a slide? And, okay. Um, we have a couple more people in here too. Just mention oh, the one with the director structure. Just okay. mention um, what it is that the test is doing and what it, why it exists because everybody's about ready to get it. Okay. They can use it. And, and yes. Okay, so uh, in the second part, we'll have the workshop, and in the workshop, we'll be giving you two boilerplate examples. One is just very simple. It's a single CPP file. Everything is there. Uh, you have the rules, the ASTs, etc., minus the error handling. And then the second part, the second example will be the same grammar, same example, but this time it's a complete system. You have it, it is a test-driven test system. You have these input files, and you have expect, expect files. So essentially what it, it's done here is that uh, in this, exam, in this uh, test program, it runs through all the examples here and compares what's the input is from what's expected. So the input is given to the parser. The parser generates something. It'll be a printout or something. And it's compared against what's expected. And if there's a failure, that will be reported. So this is very important for us. We, we have lots and lots of input files and expected files for our tests. So we always um, test every part of the uh, grammars that we, we, we are writing. Joy, yep. If, if I was to write something that output um, a float, you know, kind of complicated or hard. Yes. Time, so it's the same. How would you handle that? OK. So it's n notice that we have two test um, programs here. One is the parse expression test. OK, repeat the example. Yeah, you can just answer. OK, I'll just answer. <laughs> One, the parse expression test, what this does is that it parses the input file and then prints the EST and then compares that EST against the expected file. So that's what it does. But it's a more, uh, uh, more uh, elaborate than that. It can do ha handle different cases. For example, in this case, the second test we have here is uh, evaluating the expression. So we pipe the input into the parser, into the compiler, and then interprets that. And then the interpreter print something, the result, and then that result will be what's expected here. So for example, uh, function call input, for example, if you say um, sign 90, in this test here, the first test, it'll just print the syn syntax tree and compare that against what's expected. But in this test, it will actually evaluate the expression and then compare that against what's expected. Did that answer your question? It, or, uh, am I clear enough? OK. So um, uh, the last part is walking the tree. Attribute parsing versus semantic actions. Avoid semantic actions. Generate abstract syntax trees instead. Imperative semantic actions are ugly words in an elegant declarative grammar. I really dislike semantic actions and I don't want to put imperative code in a declarative grammar. Maybe it's just me, but that's what uh, we are sharing here as the best practice. There are more reasons. Semantic actions look even uglier and verbose in X3 with native C++ Lambda. If you've seen Phoenix, it's very simple. For example, you have an, uh, a calculator. You have the synthesized attributes, underscore val. You add 
into that. So you say add underscore val plus equals underscore one. That's it. Imagine using C++ Lambda. But in X3, we don't use Phoenix anymore. So we are using C++ Lambda. So the semantic actions are a lot more verbose than we had in um, version 2. So anyway, um, in the end, you still have a need to use semantic actions. So use semantic actions only to facilitate the generation of an attribute. Don't do anything fancy. Just make it such that it'll, it'll, it'll um, help in the generation of an, uh, the abstract syntax tree that you're, uh, you want to generate. So um, if you really can't avoid semantic actions, at least make them side effect free. That's very crucial because of backtracking. Backtracking can cause havoc when, when, because rules can be called multiple times. If you have an alternate A, B, C, if an alternate fails, it will backtrack and it may be called again. So there's a lot of um, um, confusion there with semantic action. So uh, we tried our best to get rid of semantic actions. I think we're success successful. Um, I'd say that most of our grammars that we write are 95 to 99% gra uh, semantic action free. So with, um, with ASTs, you, you generate an AST from the parser, and then you walk the AS3, transform the AST any way you want. So I'll present some simple examples on how to walk the AS3. In our previous example, the uh, fun example. So here's a simple traversal for printing the AST. This is the same AST that we had before. So it's just walking the AST. So this is essentially just a variant visitation, but it's recursive. So here's when you get a double, just prints the double. When you get an operation, operation is actually the right hand side of an expression. So the expression has the left hand side and followed by one or more of the right hand side. Uh, for example, A plus B plus C plus C, D. So you have the right hand side, which is A. Then the left hand, uh, the left hand side will be the A, and then the right hand side will be the plus B plus C plus D, and so on. So it's a loop. So we'll see the loop later. But the key point here is that we print the operator and then apply the visitor again using this visitor. So it's a recursive call. Then the expression itself calls that. The, the, uh, here's what I'm doing here is that I'm enclosing the printing of the expression only if the right hand side contains uh, one or more elements. So if, if it's just the left hand side, I don't print the parentheses because it's clear by itself. And then it goes through all of the right hand side, the right hand side of the expression, and again calls this recursively. And then the function call. So the function call is just a name. Um, what's different here is that um, I'm, I'm following the uh, Pascal stylish of a function call. If, when there's no argument, I don't print the parentheses. Only if you have one or more arguments, I, I print the parentheses. And then it goes through all of the arguments. Prints a comma only if, if it's not the first element of the argument list. So you can imagine how, how it's being printed. Okay, so that was the example of um, how uh, the AST was printed. The same example, you can reuse the same example computing and, uh, and uh, uh, doing other computations, doing transformations and so on and so forth. In this example, 
we have the same um, visitation scheme, only this time we're computing, an, uh, uh, the, we're evaluating the expression itself. So here's how it's done. We have the interpreter, and then the interpreter um, has an error handler. So th that is um, quite quite useful because um, in, in in case of in, in when you are evaluating something, sometimes there are semantic errors that's not caught by the parser. So in this case, we reuse the same error handling mechanism that's used by the parser, this time used by the interpreter. This can be, for example, an interpreter or a compiler or whatever, but it's the same, it's the same visitation scheme. So here with our interpreter, with this is a specific example of the interpreter, we have add function. So here you can pass in a lambda function and then that lambda function will internally be placed in a std map. So this, is, this, this function will be converted to something resembling this, which is um, more generic in the, in the point of view of the interpreter. So in the point of view of the interpreter, a function is just something that takes in a couple of arguments, which is already evaluated, doubles, does some computation and returns a double. So here's, uh, uh, here are examples of uh, how we are using the add function. So for example, it, it, this is uh, returning just the pi, the sign, so it's a lambda function. So you cannot notice here that we, we are using lambda function, so we, we are internally converting this, evaluating this, in the interpreter point, uh, in, in the interpreter side, in, it's somehow um, mapping what you have interpreted, and when it gets into a function, you, you evaluate the arguments, compile that into uh, a, 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 a vector of uh, doubles, and then pass that into the native function, but f in the native function, it'll have to be converted into real arguments. So there's an expansion going on inside there. So I won't deal with that. Uh, if you're interested, you can check out the code. So for example, this is an example of um, uh, what you will be typing in the interpreter, and then that will be evaluated. And then the sign function, which is what we had before, here will be called. So here's the add function. So it just converts the lambda function into this simplified function, std function. Here's an example of um, uh, uh, interpret, uh, how the, the interpreter, interpreter does its business. So the difference between the printing and the interpreter is that it's computing a value. So it just walks through the AST and computes. So you, at this point you have the left hand side, right hand side. Left, right hand side is evaluated. Left hand side is passed. Right hand side is evaluated by recursively visiting the abstract syntax tree and then returning the computation. And then here's the, uh, a bit tricky part is this for function call. So first it, it gets the name from the AST, it looks up the map, and then calls the error handler if it is not found. And then it's, next it tests the argument size, it must be the same. So if, if you have, if you say sign A comma B, wrong arity. So you hear another error here when you have a, the wrong size, when you get the wrong size. The arity is computed by some uh, uh, um, internal mechanism there from the lambda. So this is some bit of um, template metaprogramming there uh, that um, evaluates the, 
the, uh, the um, extracts the RAT of the lambda function so that we can issue error messages here if there's a, uh, uh, we have wrong RAT. And now that we get the ARDs, we just place that in, in the stack. I simplified here. Uh, I, I didn't want to do anything fancy. So we just have a maximum RAT, which is, I think, 5 or 10. And then evaluate each of the arguments calling this again. So this is the visitor, so it's recursively doing the visitation. And then when it computes the arguments, each of the arguments, it's placed in this uh, um, array, which is in the stack. And then finally, it's the, the um, std function is called. So you have the arguments here now, flattened out. So that's it. That's, um, we have that, and um, uh, Michael will be um, uh, 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 giving you the links to um, the example files. Uh, again, we have um, two simple examples. One is a single CPP file. I think um, it's best to start with that. Um, and then uh, let's see how it goes. <laughs> okay, so what's the Yeah, um, um, question. Sure. What's that? Um, at this, with this example, no, not yet. Uh, we don't have symbol tables in X3 yet. We have. Okay. Not in this example, though. That's fine. Okay. Just think about porting. Um, okay, so this is the part where we start the workshop and we don't need a camera anymore because 